Good afternoon. I'm Nikki Jones, professor and H. Michael and Jeannie Williams, department chair of African American Studies at UC Berkeley. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to the fifth conversation in our 2021-22 Critical Conversations, Catching Up with June, Black Writers in the Bay, our series. Uh, although we meet today in virtual space, let me begin with the acknowledgement that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Moekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also that the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities. And as always, we give credit and thanks to UC Berkeley Center for Educational Justice and Community Engagement and the Native American Student Development Office for crafting this acknowledgement. So welcome again to today's conversation, the fifth installment in our critical conversation series, a year long celebration of the life and legacy of writer, activist and longtime UC Berkeley faculty member, June Jordan. Building on our successful spring 2021 series celebrating Dr. Barbara Christian and exploring the concept of abolition democracy, our critical conversation series continues to ask, what are the lessons of the black feminist, black radical and black intellectual traditions for our moment what is the role of Black studies in building more just futures? The Critical Conversation series is supported by the Abolition Democracy Initiative, a three-year department initiative that began in fall 2020. The ADI is motivated and inspired by the work of W.B. Du Bois, Angela Davis, and others writing in the abolitionist tradition. The ADI amplifies the work of academics, activists, writers, artists, and poets who are actively imagining and building a world beyond policing and prisons, building a world to borrow from June Jordan in which love is a reasonable and easy response. The ADI receives support from the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, the Office of the Chancellor and the Dean of Social Sciences, Rock Array. I also wanna acknowledge and give thanks to the ADI leadership team, which includes in addition to myself, Professors Eula Taylor, Lee Rayford and Tiana Peschel. You can find a full schedule of events for this year's Critical Conversation Series on our department's website, africam.berkeley.edu. A couple of uh, logistical points. Uh, today's event is being recorded and will be posted along with other conversations as I shared on our department's uh, website, our department's YouTube channel. A live transcript of this recording is being generated and you can access uh, that with the, uh, the, the CC icon on Zoom. Uh, during the conversation, we, we want to hear from you uh, and there are two ways, one, the Q&A feature. Uh, so please post questions or comments uh, using the Q&A feature and the chat window. Uh, we like to reserve for uh, shout out, shout outs, affirmations, expressions of love and appreciation. Uh, and if you are having some serious technical trouble, you can also use the chat for that as well. Uh, a couple of final thank yous before I introduce uh, and then turn, over, turn this over to my colleague and moderator for today's panel. Professor Chayuma Elliott, uh, who will then introduce our distinguished guests for today. So I wanna thank Rachel Anspach and Kiana Pajaro for their invaluable administrative support and logistical support for both for, the, for today's event uh, and all year long. I want to thank our colleagues at ETS for supporting the webinar for today's event and all year long. And a big thank you to all of those who are watching this conversation live or on recording. Uh, thank you for joining the conversation. Uh, and finally, our deepest thanks to our panelists for today. We appreciate you taking the time to be here and we're looking forward to the conversation. So let me now introduce our moderator for today's program, Professor Chaima Elliott. Professor Elliott is Associate Professor of African-American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Our scholarly work and teaching focus on poetry and poetics, visual culture and intellectual history from the 1920s to the present. Before joining the Berkeley faculty, Professor Elliott was a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford an assistant professor of English, creative writing, and African American studies at the University of Mississippi. A Cave Con alumni fellow, she has also received fellowships from the American Philosophical Society, the James Irvine Foundation, and the Vermont Studio Center. 
She earned her, her MFA in creative writing from Warren Wilson College and her PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Elliott has published four books of poetry, Blue and Green in 2021, At Most in 2020, Vigil in 2017, and California Winter League in, tw in 2015. Her creative work has appeared in the African American Review, Callaloo, The Collegist, The Notre Dame Review, The PN Review, and other journals. She's the co-editor of several poetry chapbooks, including African American Poetic Responses to Faulkner and Of Rivers. She is currently at work on a poem cycle called Hemlin and is completing a scholarly monograph about rural life in the Harlem Renaissance. Thank you, Professor Elliott, for moderating today's panel and for curating the entire spring series of events for our Critical Conversation series. I can think of no better curator and no better moderator for today's conversation. Uh, so I turn it to you. Nikki, thank you so much. Um, it is absolutely my good fortune to be the curator of this spring semester of Critical Conversations reading, celebrating the life and legacy of former UC Berkeley faculty member and fellow poet, June Jordan. Um, Professor Jordan arrived here at Cal in 1989. The piece of her writing that I wanna put in the air before we kick off this poetry reading and conversation with our guest poets, Mahogany L. Brown and Tania Lunsford Lynx comes from Jordan's memoir, Soldier, A Poet's Childhood. Professor Jordan wrote the memoir while she was here in the Bay Area, but it's about a different geography, the New York City of her childhood. Jordan's travel writing is still noted for its eloquence and for its contributions to black feminist theory, particularly her 1982 essay report from the Bahamas, which explores the intersections of race, class, gender, and sexuality. But her writing about home, about local geography is also vivid and important. Here's a little snippet from June Jordan's memoir of her childhood, quote, Saturday morning was military and dense with arguments and contrary commotions in chaotic haste and 57 plans and 100 revisions and nevertheless, the cleaning got done and a week's supply of food got bought and put away. Then I'd hold my father's hand as we traveled all the way back into Manhattan by trolley and subway to the Museum of Natural History or the planetarium or the zoo or Rockefeller Center or Radio City Music Hall. The first time my father took me to a symphony orchestra at Carnegie Hall, it was dark. I was so excited to be up and out of the house at night. I was stunned by so many grown up people and outside in the dark. I just couldn't get over it. Were they all going to the concert? What was about to happen? And was that, was that, was that the moon? Oh, I was so excited. What was going to happen? My father kept saying, you'll see, you'll see. And finally we got there and it was very, very crowded and I was afraid I would lose my father, but I didn't. And we got to our seats and I couldn't see anything if I sat down, so I stood up and then the concert started and I was looking at all these different men wearing black and white and playing different instruments together. And I was about to explode with so many questions because I couldn't hear the music because the questions crashed around so loud inside my head, but my father put his finger to his lips so I'd keep silent. And after a while I crawled into his lap and fell asleep. End quote. After that, Jordan describes Sunday mornings getting ready for and then walking to St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Brooklyn, and it's sheer magic. Thelani Davis reflected, quote, in a borough that has landmarks for the writers Thomas Wolfe, W.H. Auden, and Henry Miller, to name just three, there ought to be a street in bed called June Jordan Place, and maybe a plaque reading, a poet and soldier for humanity was born here. Amen. I have this suspicion that moving out west helped Professor Jordan reflect on New York with such force and clarity, which is why, why it feels particularly appropriate to continue our year-long celebration of her life and work with a reading and conversation featuring a Bay Area poet and a New York poet who also writes about the Bay. Like Jordan, both care deeply about Black geography. This reading was originally slated to feature Tongo Ison Martin and Tinia Lunsford Lynx, but Tongo had a death in the family yesterday and can't join us. Our thoughts are with him and with his family right now. The amazing Mahogany L. Brown will be reading and speaking in his place. Here's to poetry solidarity. The guest poets will read their work and then doctoral candidate John Mundell and I get to co-moderate a, a Q&A with them. So please audience members use the Q&A function to send us any questions you'd like us to ask our guest poets on your behalf. Now for some brief introductions. 
Poet and fiction writer Mahogany L. Brown is the executive director of Just Media, a media literacy initiative designed to support the groundwork of criminal justice leaders and community members. This position is informed by her career as a writer, organizer, and educator. Brown has received fellowships from Agnes Gund, Air Serenbe, Kave Kanem, Poets House, Mellon Research, and Rauschenberg. She is the author, author of several recent books for children, adults, and youth, including Chlorine Sky, which came out last year, Woke, A Young Poet's Call to Justice, Woke Baby, and Black Girl Magic. Brown is the founder of the diverse lit initiative, Woke Baby Book Fair. Her latest poetry collection titled, I Remember Death by Its Proximity to What I Love, is a book length poem responding to the impact of mass incarceration on women and children. She's based in Brooklyn and is the first ever poet in residence at the Lincoln Center. Tania Lunsford Lynx is a writer, abolitionist, and fourth generation Black San Franciscan on both sides. She is also a proud alum of Voices of Our Nation, VONA, and the Lambda Literary Retreat. In 2018, she co curated Still Here Six Existence as Resistance, a performance featuring queer Black San Franciscans as part of the National Queer Arts Festival. Tinia is the recipient of an individual artist's grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission. She has also been awarded residencies at the Headland Center for the Arts, the San Francisco Public Library in collaboration with Radar, Mesa Refuge, the Vermont Studio Center, Oxbow, and Under the Volcano. Her work has been published in Foglifter, the Lambda Literary Anthology, and in Nothing to Lose But Our Chains, Black Voices on Activism, Resistance, and Love. Tania earned a BA from Columbia University and an MA from the California Institute of Integral Studies. She has more than 10 years of experience as a performing artist, curator, activist, and educator in San Francisco. She is currently at work on her first novel. A big welcome to Virtual Cal <laughs> to both of you. It's now my pleasure to turn over the mic to Mahogany L. Brown. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here and stand in place of my brother Tango um, and stand with all of you who are, who are kin. Uh, I would like to begin my set with um, a piece, uh, a, re a recitation of Sister June Jordan's poem, uh, a poem about violence, and it's a video. So I'm going to go ahead and mute and let that rock. My name is Mahogany L. Brown, and I am a Black poet. I refuse to remain silent while this nation murders black people. I have a right to be angry. Poem about police violence by June Jordan. Tell me something. What you think would happen if every time they kill a black boy, then we kill a cop? Every time they kill a black man, then we kill a cop? You think the accident rate would lower subsequently? Sometimes the feeling like amaze me baby comes back to my mouth and I am quiet. Like Olympian pools from the running mountainous snows under the sun. Sometimes, thinking about the twelfth house of the cosmos, or the way your ear ensnares the tip of my tongue, or signs that I have never seen before, like danger. Women working. I lose consciousness of ugly, bestial, rapid, and repetitive affront as when they tell me 18 cops in order to subdue one man. Eighteen strangled him to death in the ensuing scuffle. Don't you idolize the diction of the powerful? Subdue and scuffle my, oh my, and that the murder, that the killing of Arthur Miller on a Brooklyn street was just a justifiable accident. Again. Again? People been having accidents all over the globe so long, like, that I reckon that the only suitable insurance is a gun. I'm saying war is not to understand or rerun. War is to be fought and won. Sometimes the feeling like amaze me, baby, blots it out. The bestial but not too often tell me something. What you think would happen if every time they kill a black boy, then we kill a cop? Every time they kill a black man, then we kill a cop. You think the accident rate would lower subsequently? It's wild to see that piece. Um, one, I'm always drawn to that, that, that poem because it's, it's timeless. The unfortunate fact is it's timeless. 
And Sister June was not only uh, ahead of our time, but, but was giving us blueprints to prepare ourselves, to steady ourselves. And um, that, that recitation, I think it happened in 2015. Um, that was my daughter that you saw. And it really was one of those spur of the moment things. I was like, how do we talk about it? But how do I talk about you too? And uh, I really, I really am thankful I got to share that with you. Thank you. Um, the next piece I would like to do is a poem that I wrote um, for Illinois Humanity in 2021. And the question, um, the poems were supposed to answer a question about, uh, I think it was re, reopen, reopen. They were reopening the world. So what does reopen mean specifically to folks who are incarcerated? What does six feet mean? What does safety mean? What does protection mean when you are incarcerated? And so this is called corrective state. San Quentin ain't got a skyline to dream about. But my uncle's pride in my ability to recover from an ankle twist on a slab of broken concrete make it seem so. Some say I play pickup games like I've been to the pen. I smirk a double dribble skipping across my mistaken face. 20 years later, a solar system rids of a planet, makes itself a new moon to rock the tides. Still, the barbed wire and shotguns work like clock clicks and my father still don't know how many times I've challenged death. The COVID-19 that spread across my chest. My breathing so close to an island submerged in fluid, I stuttered awake on the 11th night. I wept until the cold medicine carried me back to sleep. The sickness lies, a boundaryless stretch, and it's the most American thing I've ever felt. Secure in my home and still dying from the heat of capitalism. They are reopening the world after the planet tried to reset itself. And the prisons are still packed with people afraid to believe in redemption. Racist adjacent smiles, forgive white collar crimes as hedge funds funnel into protective custody, a static of dispatch, the walls clean with other men's teeth. Antibody tests smell like Henrietta Lacks coming back to remind us of what happens when you trust a house of poachers and they call us ungovernable, the way we picket and protest. This morning is a reminder, still bars don't melt with silence. The people behind bars are captives of war. The people behind bars are captives of war. The people stolen into camps and cages speak it plain. I want to go home. I want to hold my daughter. I want to see my mother one last time. There ain't no poem in that. The human form was not meant to be locked up, locked down, cage bound. Consider your own bones, the way they lengthen as soon as you turn your face to the sun, a mask over your nose, relinquishing itself to this adaptation of love. Inhale, inhale the day crisp in its welcome. Send a kite to Folsom as we correct our form. Mm. And since I'm talking about the nation, uh, this piece is, uh, it happens in, in the footnote and you can find it um, with McSweeney's number 65. Um, I was asked to write a poem responding to plundering. And I thought, <laughs> we just show them the whole map. What you mean? <laughs> this, whole, this whole joint is, is the result of plundering, what? But all right, if I have to do it through a poem, it goes. Question, when do you know your country is a question unanswered? Answer, the moment a ghost of an immigrant whispers, or we realize this country ain't gonna give us no freedom. Freedom ain't nothing but a word, ain't nothing but a pretty song in the key of an anthem that ain't ours. The moment we learn liberation ain't ours, unless we are willing to demand it, decolonize for it. Unless we are willing to lose our own selves forward, unless we are willing to lose our place in the capitalism of things. Order in the room, the court, the womb, got a flag planted in it. Unless we walk through the valley of the damned, slice the air with more than intentions, pled allegiance to the end of politics and patriarchy, pled allegiance to the end of state-sanctioned death. Be uncomfortable for it. Be uncomfortable in it. 
picket line uncrossed until we obligate our last breath to the justice of our murdered and mistreated, until we gift the new world an accountability plan, Black Dawn ordained with the nectar of equity, until we relocate a jury who ain't our peers, watch them lose teeth and sleep over babies murdered for practice, watch them lose weight over crime reports, faulty pipes, invisible borders erected in the likeness of small men, garden soil turned graveyard, a lecture in divisibility. When we begin to walk around with our hands cloaked, face mask on, the real color of reckless, black and alive, brown and alive, indigenous and alive, trans and othered and alive, poor and disabled and still people living eyes gleaming like the prayers they choose to forget. These poems, these poems be in the business of getting dirty. Watch the ghosts and duppies and spirits rise. Watch our ancestors return to plunder the earth of spilled salt genealogy. These poems are just a timestamp, a righteous light, a placeholder, a touchstone of what irrational fears can steal. Liberation ain't ours unless we are willing to demand it decolonize for it, unless we are willing to lose our own selves for it, unless we are willing to lose. Ain't no room in capitalism for the healthy and the womb still got a flag planted in it. Ain't you scared? Question, can water clean a history? Answer, no. This water cannot rinse the blood from our streets. It is too heavy with lead. Um, speaking of blood, um, I'm going to read, okay, I have some time. All right, so I'm going to read this piece that is named after a haiku written by Sister Sonia, and then I'm going to read a piece that I wrote for Sister Sonia. What I love about these spaces, specifically when we bring our literary icons, um, when we, we when we allow the room to be of our literary icons, I am I am so much a fan of that. That is uh, my ministry. That is the way in which I walk. I am only here because someone um, survived for me to be here. I'm only here because someone made space for me to be here. And it looks they always look like my mother. They always look like my grandmother. They always look like my great grandmother. And so, uh, shout out to y'all for knowing what to do. And shout out to this uh, group, this, uh, I was about to say group chat. That's what these feel like sometimes, you know, like the virtual world, you don't know what you want to say. It's all text, but I want to give you props for the fire. Thank you, Lacante Deal, um, Nancy, all y'all keep on talking. So we, you know, we know we're not just speaking into a void. So this piece is called Poem of Blood. Um, named after Sister Sonia's um, haiku, where she says, come windless invader, I am a carnival of stars, a poem of blood. And this was the first poem I wrote after coming out of the fog um, when I contracted COVID-19. I contracted COVID in March of 2020. So this is before we had a vaccine, okay? I didn't know what was happening. I just know I couldn't taste or smell. And that lasted first 11 days where I just thought I was, not going to make it. And obviously we know how serious that can be. But then I had long haul syndrome and I didn't regain my taste or my sense of smell for I think about six months. Um, so I'm very, very, very uh, lucky to be here. And um, I decided I'm going to write with the ferocity of June Jordan. I'm going to speak with the fearlessness of Audre Lord, I'm going to, you know, drop it low on the stage uh, to tell the truth about that poem, like Sister Sonia Sanchez, and they just got to be mad because time is time. What? What's that? What is time? That's a whole. That might be a whole nother dissertation. We'll we'll work on that. So, poem of blood. The first to go are your breasts, hanging like sandbags sad and remembering who they used to be. The way a wind chime whistle can sound like a refrain. Stay home, daughter. No one wants to talk about a woman's body during a disaster, like she's the disaster, walking and moving slow towards the sun. They rather talk about the things they can't want to change until it's voting season or tax season or killing season, extra, extra, 
Another black girl is forgotten till dust. The poets only remember her boyfriend's name or her brother's shoe size. They only remember the black girl body after she is gone. The pastor reads from Genesis, we nod, pay ties, pass the plate and erase her, erase her initials from the scoreboard. Even the black feminist forgets she was once a girl child. She closes her eyes and calls her son prophet, tells prophet to never trust women, then twists his dreads with homemade beeswax. Her fingers crack like stomped earth, her scalp tingling with bad news, and the news say a disaster is coming. Call it Irma, Katrina, Rona, America. Got a pension for baby's breath and blood milk. But the block's still hot in Brooklyn, and the nannies still push strollers full of babies they ain't birth, cause the governor warned stay home, but the landlord echoed rent due. Go ahead, America, wreck havoc on the plantation and charge the sharecropper to remove the sewage. Stay safe, stay home, or fall smoke lung, lung as the next internet sensation relies on old hip hop t-shirts and yoga pants while Lizzo teaches her how to be human. Yeah, even the trees look at black bodies like welcome back. And the baby in the stroller ain't heard a lullaby since they dreamt Similac, brown organic raw sugar go for double the price at Whole Foods. Get in line, six feet fam, don't sleep fam. Paychecks from the government, courtesy of the taxes already paid three times the amount since the last two runs around this week ass moon. Gil Scott Heron was right. Here we all smack slapped against the light of a smudged badge number, glint my eyes, flint in my sky. Everybody want my census report, but don't nobody want to give me health care. The water got blood in it. The trees got a memory. My city ain't on fire, but the fog is heavy. Each building swaddled in gray shit that makes us sick. Cover your mouth, cover your nose, stay inside, stay home. Or be run over and up on by the white woman who walks her dog so close you can hear what she's thinking. Six feet who? The neighbors don't see me, but the broken man on the corner do my breasts. Old with age, they sag like my spirit. He Timberland boot and black mask bark. He play brave, stomp his feet, and take up more sidewalk than there is concrete. He howls at the sky like it ain't 12 p.m., like we ain't in a crisis. His eyes dart from my chest to my cheeks, but I'm an old broad now, and I got plenty of anger to lend. The days have bled from two weeks till forever, and I got blood on my mind. I dare him one time, kiss my teeth loud, then dare him with the clearing of my throat. <clears> throat> it sounds like a funeral. It distracts, it distracts him from the sound of my key rings turning into knuckle rings, but he knows the difference between frail and feral. He replaces his mask, corks his speech, and lets me pass an unhinged door on tilt. Oh, can you hear the wind sing? So close to death, so close to life. Little water, little daughter, come home. Mm-hmm. Thank y'all. Snap, snap. Y'all amazing. All right. Um, so this poem is for Sister Sonia Sanchez. Uh, and I had the honor of reading it, performing it uh, for her, to her. And I thought, I well, there's so many ways in which I learned her work. Um, I learned her as blueprint. I learned her, you know, as matriarch. I learned her as, you know, survival. I, I learned her as celebration. And I wanted to bring all of that in to this piece. So it's in three parts. The first is a cento, which includes the lyrics or the lines from my favorite poems by her. The second is the dissertation because I too have went to one of them grad programs child and that MFA had to come out in the wash. I had to make it make sense. So the second is the dissertation. And then the third is the homage. It's called Root Work. One, Cinto. Forgive me if I laugh. You are so sure of love. You are so young and I am too old to learn. Can you tell the morning stars, the air so sweet, river dark with sound, speech and breath? Can you tell the stars and the ocean? She is a holy one, leaving trail of witnesses smiling. A man, a woman, our braided spaces, glass gone mad, yellow rays of thin light, shiny sugar and pure woman. Conceal a symphonic shudder, a thousand sermons, conjugated pain. 
Wild stars, southern eyes bloom in the night. We taste the blue midnight, stars between my teeth. Black magic is you, caught in my voice. It is a wild sea. Love shifts the air and we blossom black. Picture a woman, her spine, her rotating the earth, her leaning into our birth cloud eyes, jumping rivers, inhaling moons. Imagine her free too. I ain't known I was worth the snarl and spit. This name, this black girl gone, black woman arrival. I ain't never known I was worth fighting for until I read a Sonia Sanchez poem. Three, root workers. We roll up sleeves and bend from the knees. We sing beneath our breath, it's gonna be heavy. We still swing big despite the justice system of letdown and we still show up on time. We arms open, we hands open, we hearts open, and we love the way we fight until empty, until sun replenishes, until laughter fills the well. We return to the front line. We hammer, we hatchet, we ready and ready to love a life. We ready to rock a stone cold gaze into dust. The black girl you watched harassed is someone's daughter. The black woman you watch berated is someone's daughter. There is no redemption in swinging out of your weight class. There is no glory in the demise of our black women. We be the daughters. We be the bridge makers. We be the pot servers. We be the cleanup crew. We be the aunties. We be the writers. We be the spell weavers. We be the holiest of holy. We pray for you. We double-edged women, we gather like a fist. We gather like a fist of freedom papers. We coal of storm, we coal of storm and glory. We a country surrounded by ghosts. We pray for ourselves. We watch our sisters pray for we, we blessed in this knowing. We black palms open and up. We black spirit and divine. We ain't never been steel bars. We ain't never been glass ceiling. We ain't never shuck, nah. We saunter, we saunter, we saunter the testimony. We clean, we clean, we clean the spirit. We manifest, we manifest. And we ain't leaving till we choose. We be the daughters. We be the daughters. And we got root work to do. And so they say you ain't supposed to be here, black girl. You ain't supposed to wear red lipstick. You ain't supposed to wear high heels. You ain't supposed to smile in public. You ain't supposed to smile nowhere, black girl. You ain't supposed to be no more than a girlfriend. You ain't supposed to get married. You ain't supposed to want no dream that big. You ain't supposed to dream at all. You ain't supposed to do nothing but carry babies and carry felons, and carry weaves, and carry silence, and carry families, and carry confusion, and carry a nation, but never an opinion. Cause we ain't supposed to have nothing to say, black girl, not unless it's a joke. Cause you ain't supposed to love yourself, black girl. You ain't supposed to find nothing worth saving in all that brown. You ain't supposed to know that Tina, Beyonce, Cicely, Shonda, rhymes, shine, 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 black girl. You ain't supposed to love your mind. You ain't supposed to love. You ain't supposed to be loved up on. You only supposed to pose voodoo child, vixen style. You're supposed to pop out babies and hide the stretch marks. You're supposed to be still. So still they think you statue. So still they think you chalked outline. So still they keep thinking you stone until you look more Medusa than Viola Davis. Until you sign more Shanae, then Kerry Washington. Until you're more side eyed than Michelle Obama on a Tuesday. But you tell them we are more than a hot comb in a washing set. You are Kunta Kinte's kin. You are a black or worth remembering. And you were a threat knowing yourself. You were a threat loving yourself. You were a threat loving your kin. You are a threat loving your children. You black girl magic. You black girl fly. You black girl brilliant. You black girl wonder. You black girl shine. You black girl bloom. You black girl. Black girl, and you turning into a beautiful black woman right before our eyes. 
Thank y'all so much. And I'm very excited to hear from the next poet and sister, Tania. Oh, mahogany. Oh, that medicine. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oof. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. So grateful to have received and witnessed. Dang, I gotta read too. I'm like, wait. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to just be in the company, be in the spirit. Um, I'm Tania Lunsford Links. And oh, I'm gonna read some things. I'm going to be invited to this journey of celebration for June Jordan. Um, yeah, I, I just, I feel the presence. Um, so I wanna begin uh, with Poem For My Love by June Jordan. Um, and it was between, I love, this is one of my favorite pieces of hers um, because I just so deeply appreciate the, the intimacy in the creation of our intimate worlds in the midst of, of chaos. Um, that ability has been a lifesaver uh, for me, especially in this moment. So I'm gonna start with that. Poem for my love. How do we come to be here next to each other in the night? Where are the stars that show us to our love inevitable? Outside, the leaves flame usual in darkness and the rain falls cool and blessed on the holy flesh. The black men waiting on the corner for a womanly mirage, I am amazed by peace. It is this possibility of you asleep and breathing in the quiet air. Mm. Um, I also bring that piece because um, whenever I teach joy, like writing and kind of deepening our practice with joy, I, I bring that piece because I think quite often we expect that joy is like, you know, only real if it's knocking at our door with like a top hat and a bow on. But June Jordan teaches us that joy is in all of the small things, all of the love, all of the intimacy, all of the places uh, and moments that we're able to steal outside of capitalism and really be with each other and witness each other. Um, I'm gonna read a newer piece of my own. Uh, it's called Bright Street or The Man on the Moon Arrives Before Leaving. First, he exited the frame before he entered. Then he made tracks zipping from the stage right to left in a blink. You've missed him. They told me, you can't blink or, or you'll miss them. My grandmother's collage garage on Bright Street is a haven, a relief, an already tearing tapestry taped and stapled and nailed together. The walls are made of stolen traffic signs and there's a newspaper clipping of a Georgia joke only my grandfather understands, but it's there on our California meat freezer. The man on the moon wants his arrival to be a surprise. So I don't know we're going to pick him up until my pregnant aunt is behind the wheel telling us to call her auntie now. Not her first name, unless auntie precedes said first name. The talk itself feels like a slap on the hand. The man on the moon is on the pier when we get there with a cardboard box that holds his personal effects. He places the box in my aunt's trunk and leaves it there until she sells the car two years later. He's back across the water again at that point. It was just a blink and we missed him. The man on the moon stirs the crowd, winding up my grandmother's hill to her house marked 351. The phone is always ringing to announce his arrival because when he's absent, there's no preparing for him. And when he's present, that is all there is until he's gone. My grandmother pulls the phone's long curling cord to the garage. She waits on standby with the green clothes hamper and that torn handle, her shaking leg, her tapping slippered foot, her cigarette ash in the gray water of the bubbling over sinks rinse cycle. I was just a small girl wanting to be real. Real by way of having my own heavy thing to carry around by a precarious handle. On my hand, uh, on my head, or, or maybe leveraged against hip or side pocket but she tried to protect us from it all. She wanted us to be free. And I still can't calculate the cost of that because she did such a great job of hiding the receipts. The man on the moon careens through the top of the frame, 
riding across the sky on his motorcycle, blowing a hole through the moon itself as it rises over top of the hill Daly City. He tumbles just out of the frame onto my grandmother's front lawn with a scar from ear to ear, or the top flap of his hand dancing over his knuckles, or, 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 and we never run out of peroxide for him. My grandmother tells the story when they tell the house, tells us it was rented to prevent us from being attached to it, pulling the rug as if to say, this was never ours. We were never ours here, or we are ours somewhere else. But the new place doesn't have plastic stapled on every peach colored stair or a bathroom window where you can see all the way to heaven from the toilet. The man on the moon used to visit us in that house where my grandmother's purple crystal ball held my ominous prediction and the fog crept over the sea like a promise making its way to us. That living room framed all that was left of the quiet world, but it too has been swallowed up, cream dolloped curtains and all. In that house, there was a dining room table perpetually set, but never for us. The blue kitchen counter tile was my seven up cake, my bottom cabinet frosted flakes, my cousin's stuttering giggle, my grandpa's dragging feet zip zipping across the plastic hallway runner, his territorial bathroom knocking and baked peanut smell whistling through the house. The oven door clamping shut, satisfied with another cake whose spirit didn't drop out of the middle before getting a chance to rise. The Lysol sprang to meet the sound of the creaking bathroom door and the smell of green soap in the shower. These textures of us pressing down all at once make the sound of our signature chord. There will always be too much grief to look at if you do it with both eyes, but I hope you don't blink and miss it. Care is braided into my Sunday hairstyle and preserved under a knotted stocking cap. My grandmother's signature mole is drawn and loving mock above my little mouth. I remember the top of my small head in the corner of the hallway mirror passing through from the garage. I used to imagine an evil man hid there, prepared to surprise the man on the moon with a second smile from below his chin that summer when he exited the frame before I entered. My entry into this house is like relaxing into a second warmer skin. I spider up the steps on hands and bony little legs into the light and warmth that this place has to offer me, just out of the frame at the top of the stairs. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm sharing a lot of pieces today that are about San Francisco because I was born and raised there. My family has been there for about four generations on both sides. Um, and I'm writing about a San Francisco that was very black. I'm writing about a San Francisco where all my neighbors knew me and would call and tell my grandma if I was acting up on the walk home from school because they could see me. Um, and they saw me also in such a, such a special uh, and unique way. And of course, um, I'm writing about a San Francisco that for many uh, is a fiction. Uh, because there are about 3% of Black folks left in San Francisco. Um, I'm also writing about a San Francisco where in 2018, over 56% of the population of jails was full of Black folks. Um, and so in my writings, I'm, I'm remembering, I'm also proclaiming, I'm also creating, working with a, a hologram of folks who can uh, remember the same place I'm talking about and who can bring that alive as we talk to each other and talk with each other. Um, but I'm also talking about a San Francisco that is one of resistance um, and one that is uh, changing in a way that is uh, violent and has been changing in a way that is violent for us for a long time. Um, I would like to share a short film uh, that I made. It's about four minutes long. It's called Capital and Broad. And I created this film in 2018, 2018, 2019. Um, through Quack Map, so the Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project. Um, I was a part of a cohort of folks who wish challenged uh, with creating a short film in about, I think less than 48 hours. So from beginning to end, uh, we shot the thing, I shot the thing, edited the thing, got, got my family together. Um, and I'm really, really proud of the invitation to, to share something that is, um, that's imperfect and that's true. Um, about the neighborhood that I grew up in. So 
I'll share Capital and Broad, if we could bring that up. Um, and this piece is based on a, a poem by the same name, uh, which was commissioned by the SF MoMA in 2019 as well. So I'll put myself on mute and we can watch that. Capital and Broad. Grace grows generationally at the liquor store. My grandma was treated any old kind of way. My daddy ran the block. And my high school graduation photo is up and left of the Newports, between the plastic above the counter. One day on this corner, my father told my mother a joke. She covered her mouth to laugh, and I came out on the other end. Of course, this is not all there is, but this is where most of us is. Inside the house cursed with three generations of addiction, so my Nana sold it when my mother went to rehab. The new owners, knowing nothing about what to do during a raid, or what to do when your mother goes to rehab, or what to do about the remaining black neighbors, resold it for $1 million and still couldn't get the ghosts out. They added bars on the front windows and fixed the front gate trying and failing to. Laundry and mambas, now laters and rhododendrons, the streetcar is changing colors again today. My cousin rolls up in his mother's squeaking car while I wait to see if inbound or outbound will round the corner, like flipping a coin, like shaking an eight ball. Which way will I wrap my arms and grip this city today? I've watched the library become a blue paint chipped void on the corner since I could read. I've watched the Pentecostal church become condos and still sing. I've forgotten about the house next door to ours. Was it green with smooth slats or was it textured like goosebumps? And who was it who used to sit up on the windowsill, stretching out to the neighbor's landing, leaning slightly into the tiny gap between our two houses as a joke? I'm moving whoever it was would say, as if they could lean just a bit more out of that window and start a new life next door. We would laugh. I've forgotten who was there laughing with me. The consonants in our names are being whispered through the low looping telephone wires, even after the security cameras are installed, and my picture is ripped down off of the plastic in the store and is replaced with a tax. My handprint is still in the concrete in front of our old house, and the park is still full of dirt from underneath my father's fingernails, even though they tried to ship him away. In the laundromat, on the corner, it stays open late night whirring with the electricity from my great-grandmother's teeth grinding beyond the grave. Of course, this is not all there is, but this is us. This is ours. This is where most of us is. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Um, yeah, it feels good to see my folks and to be able to celebrate them in real life and in real time. Um, I'm going to read uh, one last piece. Um, I may have a tiny piece left in me, but I'll, def I'll definitely read this one. Um, it's called I Used to Live Here. 
Um, this is actually the first time I'm reading all of these pieces together. And I feel like I'm bringing up different parts of the city and different uh, ages and different people. And so it's, it's beautiful to, to feel all of them here. I used to live here. I used to live here, but my whole hood is a museum now and my whole city is a playground with rules against me. This used to be a good place for a young witch to practice raising hell with two, two small hands, a place for getting on the back of the bus without paying and still feeling dignified shouting back door. This used to be a good place to be nobody, to hide from the two rough fingers of the world under thick fog until you caught your breath and could run again or so I'm told. By the time we got here four generations ago, all the good hiding spots for catching your breath were taken or we weren't allowed to buy. You used to be able to find a lost auntie in the tenderloin who told good stories and forgot whose secrets were whose. You used to be able to dream about life as a low rider and a black cowboy here. You used to could have little baby dreams. You used to be able to get your fortune told by the man in front of the liquor store who had been revived from death twice for the price of one loose Newport. My grandmother used to lean over in the left side of her chair using her right hand to rub huge circles on her hips when the rain was coming. My grandmother who burped when she was feeling anxious. You used to be able to have a grandmother here. I'm 17 years old when my boo and I have matching Jordans and matching North faces zipped up to our chins. We kick out the red stop request signs on the M train and put them on a necklace and wear them like a prize. Where did all the imagination in the city go? There's not even a Blondie's downtown no more. Where are all the black and brown children in the city? Somewhere being treated like extinction. They dug up our bones when they turned over the dirt and then projects where Anthony's granny used to live. It's a high rise now with the best views any building built on black backbones could build. Or so they say, they won't let me up to see the view. My head fell off while running to catch the 50 of four again today. It's made me remember the neighborhood that used to live under this hologram. It's made me remember the me that used to grow blooming under this microscope like a germ. I used to live here. Several leagues beneath the sand and sea at Ocean Beach where people are burning out fog machines to keep their traction going. There's another layer of alternate reality. A universe where I can't find parking anywhere in the mission and the light goes out at my grandmother's house and none of us lives there. And the house with our multi-generational miracle in it is up to $1 million on Zillow, tumbling profit as it gets bought and sold every year. And I see people whose singing voices made me cry with joy, lying in the street with no shoes on, and I'm losing teeth in all my dreams. I used to live here. Before my sister had the baby and summer returned in September in time to celebrate. When Cesar Chavez was Army Street and I only knew one patrol hill, and there was no pizza and no dog walking there before NOPA, when we couldn't be queer, so we had to really enjoy our Halloweens in the Castro, when the Metreon was still new and the fast light in Yerba Buena Gardens was the top of the world and downtown was a Friday night activity brought to you in part by a long paper transfer or a pass with a Y on it. I know hood and hippie talk. I know ain't, I know hyphy, I know gumbo. I know that you don't have to get out of the car to enjoy the view, but the wind has magic in it. I know that nobody puts their feet in the water, but there's a blessing in it for you if you do. I used to live here and I'm coming back for all my shit. I'm coming back for all of our shit. All of our after Bart stops running shenanigans, all of our heart to hearts around Lake Merced a million times. After all the little things we got away with stealing at Stonestown Mall. After our standing in line for Jordans and driving our mother's cars without licenses and being curious about the significance of why the warning siren blares on Tuesdays at 12 of all times. I'm coming back for our San Francisco, whether or not they let me across the bridge. I want to see it up close. I want to see us up close. I want to meet all of our mothers hanging out of the windows, looking left and right for us to come barreling down the blocks when it's time to come home. I want this for all of us. I want it to be how it was when I used to live here. Thank you. Um, it seems like I have maybe a moment more. So I'll read this tiny piece called My Job. Um, when I think of June Jordan, um, I think of her work as an educator. 
um, and how it inspires so much of how I show up for my students. Um, I teach at City College of San Francisco and this semester I'm so grateful to be teaching a class called African American Women in the US. Um, and so I get to bring so much of her uh, and her words and her brilliance to my class. And so this poem is inspired by my work at City College. It's called My Job. My job is to fight for a future where my students don't have to be heartbroken by minimum wage where capitalism stops stealing our dreams and reselling us our own ideas with tax. I want my students to have a future where wage theft is talked about like a horror story around a campfire, white rabbit, white rabbit. I want a future where my students don't have to work to eat, don't have to be the best at something to be treated humanely. My job is to find language and give words for our most intimate experiences of ourselves. My job is to see the future see it queer, queerly too, queerly and clearly, and breathe life into it. So I see my students graduating. I see them smiling and pulling their tassels one side to another. I see them holding their babies on their hips. I see their mothers holding their diplomas. I see them blocking traffic, blocking business as usual in defense of each other. I see them having the right words at the right moment. Sometimes I just see them doing nothing and this is a luxury and delight. I hold them in for as long as I can. Every teacher I have ever loved, loved me back at eye level, poured into me with a soft but heavy hand, saw me, saw me growing and saw me fist fighting a system bigger than all of us, saw me resting and writing and made me possible, made my fight possible. I am made from the magic of teachers who saw me in the future and who refused to see a future without me. My job is to carry forward this lineage, to reach back and pull forward a song, to let the words fly out of my mouth and to revel in the sounds of all the voices all around us joining in around me. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, so many things, y'all are blessings. Y'all are blessings. Tania, I am never able to read Capital and Broad without crying. Like, and hearing you read it, I'm just, I'm still just totally just destroyed in the best possible way. Um, let me kick us off with this. And I want to say to everybody, everybody who's, who's in the audience, um, send us questions in the Q&A function so we can, we can ask them uh, to Mahogany and to Antonia. All right. So to both of you, um, here's the first question I've got. Um, both of you do a lot, so much to showcase the work of other artists, other local artists, including youth artists, incarcerated artists, artists impacted by the criminal justice system. When did you start building creative community in this way? And why do you think that making room for art and artists matters here in the Bay Area and in New York? I'll let whoever, whoever wants to jump yeah. in, jump in first. Yeah, um, I, let's see, I started youth organizing when I was like 13 or 14. Um, I started my organizing journey as a youth outreach worker and in community with other kids who had incarcerated parents. Um, so I am really grateful that I had an early opportunity to share my story creatively and to be in community with other young folks who um, were experiencing the particular grief and loss of like losing a parent to a system. Um, so I think if I had not been in that community, I think I would have thought I was one of the only people who suffered in that particular way, because that's one of the things that mass incarceration does through isolation and marginalization. So um, I feel really grateful that my journey to uh, activism, to advocacy, to all of that has been so interwoven with art and with poetry and with using my voice. Um, and I'm grateful I found it as a young person. I don't know who I'd be without it. And so um, in my work now, I work with high school students at Ruth the South School of the Arts in San Francisco. Um, there I direct the spoken arts program. And so that's a lot of our, our work, building community uh, together and knowing that those, these, these struggles and these superpowers are so interwoven. Yeah. I'm still speechless after Tania's reading too. So sorry, it's gonna take a minute. Yeah. I actually 
It's interesting. I ran so, so long. I ran very, very long from talking about mass incarceration outside of my writing, my own personal writing. It might show up in a poem. I've been writing since 1998 and a full-time artist since 2001. And it's all in my work. But I wasn't really doing the heavy lifting of removing the, the veil of shame, right? So I think after attending, um, maybe 2002, I went to teach a poetry workshop in prison. And I thought, okay, I mean, it made sense because, you know, it's, it feels like family, right? My, my entire, the entire, um, my entire family has been impacted by incarceration. All the men have been incarcerated at one point in time. We're all struggling still in some capacity if we have not lost them to the system. My father's been in prison my entire life. Um, and it, it took, a, even, it takes like a lot for me to even say that now to be like, yeah, so like the writing happens, but the, the writing wasn't bomb. <laughs> the writing was like query, right? Like it's continuously asking the questions. And I, I didn't have a way to do that as a young person because I was told to mind my business. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I did learn um, from that, you know, that uh, container, how to like go back to that space and use those moments to really unpack what I was going through, what I was feeling and how to talk about it now. So within the last five, six years, mass incarceration has been a large part of my like everyday work. Whether I'm doing, well, um, excuse me, whether I'm writing poems, um, using only the interviews from sisters that are incarcerated, whether I'm, you know, writing pieces um, that will be put on the side of a prison, whatever it is, um, within the last five years, it's been extremely intentional um, and painful because, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't have that same, that same um, journey that Tania talked about. I wish that my family knew that we didn't have to be ashamed about it and that there was some more space for us to learn how to, to heal. Um, but now um, I am thankful for the fact that it's always been writing, it's always been civic engagement, it's always been literary art practice since I started writing. That's all I did with young people um, as a youth mentor um, in women empowerment spaces, th that has been like the focal point. Um, and now I, 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 I think I've, uh, you know, the scope is, <laughs> it's, it's coming back in instead of just out. I'm looking more inside of what does mahogany need? What does, what does little Mo need? You know, uh, so black girl magic happened because little Mo needed to be reminded that she was beautiful despite being taught all the ways in which people um, make fun of us. And little Mo needs to remember that her father didn't abandon her. Um, our, the country abandoned her and took her father from her. And so like these poems and this work um, is happening now um, from, from that space, I think. John, you um, wanna ask the, the next question? Sure. Um, thank you both for these so powerful readings. It's I'm very nervous to ask you questions because I kind of just want to sit with the power that that we've witnessed. But um, you know, something came to mind about I know Tania, you your I believe your video is on um, display in a public space. Uh, Mahogany, you just mentioned that as well of your work being on public display. And I'm thinking about, you know, when I drive down, I think it's Goth Street in San Francisco, there's a quote by Maya Angelou, who herself is, a, you know, a, was a young adult in San Francisco, first woman to ever drive a streetcar in San Francisco, um, even though she lied about her age, which is, I love that. And, uh, but she has this quote that's etched into the wall of a building. And so I'm thinking about, um, placemaking, even just like architecture, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be etched, but uh, how you all are approaching place and belonging, um, be it in San Francisco or Brooklyn or Roots in Oakland as Black poets, as Black writers, 
um, how you see writing as an act of placemaking, of, of etching um, into space, and maybe how public space can work um, reparatively, or hopefully in that sense, mm. with your work? That's a great question. I just want to quote that Tanea said, I'm coming back for my shit. Like that's just it. everything I do is just a reminder that all this is ours. There's no room that I'm not allowed in. I built the room, right? My mother's work built the room. My grandmother's sweat built the room. My grandfather's hands built the room. So every time I walk in a space, I'm never like, oh, I shouldn't be here. I'm like, finally, y'all was y'all in the way. <laughs> Move. You know, like I literally am unimpressed by the invitations and thankful, right? But I'm not like grateful. I'm not like, oh, thank you. So I'm just, yeah, what word, catch up. Because the people know the truth. And I feel like we've been giving the institutions so much um, power. The people are the power. And, and the poems that I write, I'm not afraid to do them anywhere. Um, so I, I, I love, th thank you for that question. The first time I was able to see my poem, I think I, there's a mural and it has some of Black Girl Magic written on it. It's in Kingston, New York, um, where uh, uh, Sojourner Truth had a home there. And it was for her birthday. A commemoration. And that was the first time I think I've seen myself like that. And I was like, oh, that's right. Cause we already supposed to be here, right? Like we need to see ourselves that the babies walking by need to see that this is their path to this, whatever they want from here, from this world, from this planet is, is theirs. So I, I love the idea of the poems reclaiming space and reminding, um, reminding the universe, this is ours. I'm excited to return to it. Yes. Yes. So much yes. Um, yes. I think in the context of San Francisco, um, yes, all of that is also ours. Yes, we created uh, so much of what makes that place that place. Um, and I think so much of Black history of San Francisco is purposefully erased, is purposefully built over. Um, I imagine too, Mahogany, when you come home, so that's true for Oakland as well. Um, and it's an act of violence. Uh, so when I, I first approached writing, um, honestly with receiving letters from my dad from prison. And so I wanted to read my own mail. I wanted to have my own conversation. And so writing was the tool that made the space between us just a little more bearable uh, because I could read and hear his voice and he could read once I was able to write back and see the world the ways that I was seeing it from my eye level. Um, and that's magic. That is magic to me. Um, and so the idea of reclaiming space by putting words, by putting photos, all of that um, on the side of buildings or in the street, or I feel like direct action does this as well. Like it allows us to imagine the possibility of what could be here and what should be here instead. Um, I do think right now we run into um, some neoliberalism uh, with the ways that, <laughs> that uh, you know, that art is used uh, in particular ways in cities where Black folks have been erased. And so um, whenever there's like, you know, a pushing out of Black folks, but a like, you know, reifying or etching of our words instead, um, we have to actually look at what the actions are and not just what the art is and who gets to actually enjoy the art, right? Like who who's this for if our folks are pushed out? And so uh, absolutely, we should have our words and our images and all of those things everywhere, and we should also be able to to enjoy them um, and see ourselves and see each other in that way. But I I I love it. Like when I can stumble across it, when I can afford it. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. I, yes. I have a follow up that's a little bit related to that, Tania. So, um, yeah, 
So um, one of your installation pieces, right, on the wall of the elevator at SFMOMA in the garage. Um, the art prompt for that piece, I want to share it with everybody. Quote, open space asked seven writers to pick their personal Bay Area landmarks, not the usual suspects in traveler's guides, but the buildings, corners, natural phenomena, and social spots, some of them now gone, that make this place home, end quote. Um, I feel like that prompt could have been directly inspired by your work, right? Um, what do personal landmarks help us know about a place? This is my question. What do those personal landmarks help us know about a place that more general or generic landmarks miss, you think? What do personal landmarks tell us or let us know about a space? Um, we're here. Whether you can physically see us or not, we are here. Like our, our, just as Mahogany said, like our sweat is here, our our voices are here, our blood is here. Like we we built this, um, and so I think the history of more known landmarks, sure, tells a story of like a city or a, a landscape or a cityscape, etc. Uh, but personal landmarks tell us about our connection to ancestry. Uh, tell us about history of love and injustice on the land. Um, tell us a more honest story that is existing outside of capitalism, existing outside of tourism, existing outside of like the show. Um, so our personal landmarks just hold so much more story. There's so much more richness. Yeah, when I think about it. Thank you. I would like to add, I think that our poems are also doing that work. Like Tamiya's poem is, an, that's a landmark. You know what I mean? Like you listen to the poems or even in any of the texts. Uh, Colson Whitehead does a beautiful job with Colossus of New York. Like we have writers who are living in these spaces, spaces that would rather paint us gone than remember us because it's cheaper, right? It's cheaper to forget who died for this place to even exist. Um, it's cheaper on the conscience, it's cheaper in history books, it's cheaper with how you raise your children and if they will continue to, um, to you know, to, to, to be monstrous as their parents. Sorry, not sorry, but I, you know what I'm saying. I, I, that said, the literary work is, is the landmark. The literary, the people who are writing the everyday observation, the beauty and the mundanity, the uh, the beauty in in the diaspora and the voices that I, we were told were not valid. My first poem I stopped writing in high school because my teacher in AP Lit said that I was writing with incorrect English. They asked us to remake. They asked us to remake a classic. I remade Dante's Inferno using NWA lyrics. Brilliant one, mm -hmm. two. Totally on point. You know, I was like, so I thought this is, this is it, but that's, that's like, that's what that is as well, that you have to just remember those voices. Like we are not homogenized. We are not a monolith, but also we have to, we have to rise with the times and bring the voices that made it possible for us to be here. The chat completely agrees with you. <laughs> Everybody's yeah, absolutely. Living archives. Um, the people are the truth. Um, do you still, I hope, I hope you still have that Dante remake. No. I hope you kept it despite what the teacher said. That I actually teacher. dropped out of high school after that. Um, I dropped out for, I think the rest of the semester. You know, times is hard. West Oakland is intense and I didn't want to sit up in that classroom and, and the lady tell me the way in which me and my friends talk sitting on Helen in 32nd was improper or, or wasn't worth the poem, wasn't worth the paper or the grade. So yeah, I did drop out, but my grandma wasn't having it. She took my ass right back child. And here we are. I didn't even send her the MFA, you know, I had, I had some loans. I didn't even, I didn't even send it to her. I was like, this is your doing, but yeah, grandmoms. Yeah, grandmoms. John, you wanna pose the next question? Sure. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, and this is kind of, forgive me, it's a little bit of a meta question, but both of you talk so much about in your poems, 
like air, wind, breath, quiet, loud, burping, coughing. Um, Tania, you mentioned kind of like the quiet air as, jo as an act of joy. Um, Mahogany, your, your poem about quote unquote reopening. Um, and it brought me to the final scene of Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon um, where Milkman surrenders to the air that's what she writes, and um, flies high above guitar, escaping death. And Tania, I kind of see this sense of suspension in your own neighborhoods, kind of holding its breath against gentrification, um, mahogany, also in like the ironies that we see with COVID um, and reopening, um, but not reopening exactly. And so with this in mind, I kind of wonder how your own writing surrenders to the air, I guess you could say sits with the tension um, and what we might achieve through the surrender. Mm. These are, that is super good and hella meta, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to Black Studies at East Berkeley. I was going back to it and study, child. Uh, what does it teach us? You know, one, Shout out to, to Sister Morrison, but also I think it teaches us forgiveness. I think it teaches us forgiveness because there are plenty of times that we fail to rise to the occasion. Um, and we are hoping that, you know, we are moving with the same bravery as our ancestors. And if we're honest, we are not, not all of us. We, we have so many cushions and spaces and we think like, I would never have done this, but you don't, you don't know. <laughs> Your life is, is super, is super in comparison, even with all of the struggles. So forgiveness of self, forgiveness of, of not um, rising to a specific occasion, um, being okay with uh, being, a, trust, trusting what you've been given. Um, to show up in those situations where the art will prevail, where you may you may soar and you, or you may fall, but you you have to show up. And hopefully you you have another opportunity to forgive yourself. You know, um, I love. I didn't realize the wind came up that much. You're right. Now that I'm thinking about, it, I'm like it's a lot of wind, child. But they the wind talks. If you listen. The one will tell you, run, run, Cletus. Take care of yourself. <laughs> you are so funny. Uh, <laughs> I, um, yeah, I hadn't realized how much wind and breath and yes, and movement is, yeah. Um, I think, I think it's because I want to fix and I want to fight and um, it's unsustainable. Like the amount of fixing and fighting I want to do. Um, so I instead have to sit and look and watch and um, create a mirror. Like that's my invitation to myself is to create a mirror instead. Um, if I can't convince people that it's wrong that we have prisons for kids by telling them it's wrong, we have prisons for kids. We have, like it's wrong, we have prisons, period. And if I can't at the base level get people to see that that's abs like absurd with telling them directly like that, I have to create a mirror. And so I have to, you know, create pieces where folks are seeing that that children failing a test in second grade determines beds being built for them in adult prisons. Um, kids being kicked out of classrooms and then pushed out of classrooms and then going, you know, so if I I found that creating a mirror was more sustainable. Um, I could do that all day. Um, it does make me sick sometimes. It does make me tired also. 
Um, and it's a necessary practice um, and it's a necessary challenge for me as well. Um, so I think that's what some of the, like, whether it's, you know, warm wind or stagnant air or, or whatever that's, that's moving um, or even holding my breath, it is because my intention is to create a mirror, like as things are moving slowly or in place. Um, and I think probably growing up with fog too has something to do with it. <laughs> my relationship to fog and, you know, that, that even that, you know, like water in the air creating this entity uh, that we have a relationship to that changes over the course of the day. It's a reminder that things are moving, becoming more clear, moving, there is movement, there is possibility, there are challenges, things like that. So I think maybe that's what some of that is about. We have time for one more really quick question. So, um, so here's, here it is for you. Um, last month, I happened to be on College Avenue in Berkeley at night when the East Bay Bike Party cycled by. And it was like, it was amazing. It was blocks and blocks of utter magic. It was kind of like a low key Mardi Gras cruise on bikes, right? Just rolling down the street at night. Um, so here's the question. Um, is there a particular local place or happening that you want to write about, but you haven't yet, or that you'd like someone else to write about? I want to write the story about love at Lake Merritt. Oh. It, it's on my it's on my list. I have a whole bunch of deadlines, but that's the that's the one space where every time I went to that lake, I was like, I know what love is. Even if I don't feel it at home, even if I don't feel it in a relationship, I don't know what it is about that space. It, it's obviously the wind and the magic, but for real, for real, I I want to do that a proper love story about Bay Area love that don't make no sense. They go to quarter pound to, you know, I know quarter pound clothes. Ugh. They go to arts, arts clothes. I'm putting everything that clothes. So, you know, that's what's happening. I'm going to do that blueprint. Like you said, I'm going to do right by Oakland, um, but also by, by everyday love. How about you, Tania? Yeah. Um, Mm, I love that so much. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I think probably bus lines that have been discontinued in the city. Mm. Um, so much of my coming of age of like, you know, was like, you know, okay, I'm leaving my house in 10 minutes. Mimi, I, I'm going to come by on the bus. I'm going to put my head out the back. And then you're going to know that I'm on this bus, you know? So I, went, <laughs> I would love to have a story about the 15, which is a bus that used to roll down 3rd Street, uh, or a bus, uh, a poem, or a story about the 26 that used to roll down Valencia Street. Um, either of those buses, really. The chat is already voting for the 15. <laughs> the vein. And the very fun, Rika. Oh my gosh. Um, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you again to our panelists, Mahogany L. Brown and Tania Lunsford Links. Thank you, audience members, for joining us today and showing love for June Jordan and for Black poetry. Thanks to our seemingly omnipotent student organizers, Rachel Ansbach and Kiana Pajaro, who run things behind the scenes at the Abolition Democracy Initiative. Um, the ADI funds this reading series with the help of generous grants from the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost and the Chancellor's Office here at UC Berkeley. Thank you for funding this programming. Please come back on Monday, April 4th at noon for the final online critical conversations panel of the semester titled Black Childhoods, featuring yours truly and Joshua Bennett. Seriously, folks, it's Joshua Bennett. I am so excited to get to read with him. Um, please show up for that. He's amazing. You'll find details about that and other future events on the African American Studies website, africam.berkeley.edu. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. <laughs>